The Lockheed U-2, nicknamed Dragon Lady, is an American single-jet engine, ultra-high altitude reconnaissance aircraft operated by the United States Air Force, U.S. Air Force, and previously flown by the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. It provides day and night, high altitude, 70,000 feet, 21,000 m, all-weather intelligence gathering. Lockheed Corporation originally proposed it in 1953, approval followed 1954 and the first test flight occurred in 1955. It has been flown during the Cold War over the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cuba. In 1960, Gary Powers was shot down in a CIA U-2A over the Soviet Union by a surface-to-air missile, SAM. In 1962 Major Rudolf Anderson, Jr., was shot down during the Cuban Missile Crisis in another U-2. U-2S have taken part in post-Cold War conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, and supported several multinational NATO operations. The U-2 has also been used for electronic sensor research, satellite calibration, scientific research, and communications purposes. The U-2 is one of a handful of aircraft types to have served the U.S. Air Force for over 50 years, like the Boeing B-52. The newest models, TR-1, U-2R, U-2S, entered service in the 1980s with the latest model, the U-2S, receiving its technical upgrade in 2012. Development Background After World War II, the U.S. military desired better strategic aerial reconnaissance to help determine Soviet capabilities and intentions. Into the 1950s, the best intelligence the American government had on facilities deep inside the Soviet Union were German Luftwaffe photographs taken during the War of Territory west of the Ural Mountains, so overflights to take aerial photographs of the Soviet Union began. After 1950, Soviet air defenses aggressively attacked all aircraft near the country's borders sometimes even those over Japanese airspace and the existing reconnaissance aircraft, primarily bombers converted for reconnaissance duty such as the Boeing RB-47, were vulnerable to anti-aircraft artillery, missiles, and fighters. Richard Leghorn of the U.S. Air Force suggested that an aircraft that could fly at 60,000 feet, 18,300 m, should be safe from the MiG-17, the Soviet Union's best interceptor, which could barely reach 45,000 feet, 13,700 m. He and others believed that Soviet radar, which used American equipment provided during the war, could not track aircraft above 65,000 feet, 19,800 m. The highest flying aircraft available to America and its allies at the time was the English Electric Canberra, which could reach 48,000 feet, 14,600 m. The British had already produced the PR-3 photo reconnaissance variant, but the U.S. Air Force asked for English Electric's help to further modify the Martin B-57, the American-licensed version of the Canberra, with long, narrow wings, new engines, and a lighter-than-normal airframe to reach 67,000 feet, 20,400 m. Air Research and Development Command mandated design changes that made the aircraft more durable for combat, but the resulting RB-57D aircraft of 1955 could only reach 64,000 feet, 19,500 m. The Soviet Union, unlike the United States and Britain, had improved radar technology after the war, and could track aircraft above 65,000 feet, 19,800 m. Lockheed Proposal it was thought that an aircraft that could fly at 70,000 feet, 21,300 m, would be beyond the reach of Soviet fighters, missiles, and radar. Another U.S. Air Force officer, John Seberg, wrote a request for proposal in 1953 for an aircraft that could reach 70,000 feet, 21,300 m, over a target with 1,500 nmi, 1,700 miles. 2,800 kilometers, of operational radius. The U.S. Air Force decided to solicit designs only from smaller aircraft companies that could give the project more attention. Under the code name Bald Eagle, it gave contracts to Bell Aircraft, Martin Aircraft, and Fairchild Engine and Airplane to develop proposals for the new reconnaissance aircraft. 
Officials at Lockheed Aircraft Corporation heard about the project and decided to submit an unsolicited proposal. To save weight and increase altitude, Lockheed executive John Carter suggested that the design eliminate landing gear and avoid attempting to meet combat load factors for the airframe. The company asked Clarence Kelly Johnson to come up with such a design. Johnson was Lockheed's best aeronautical engineer, responsible for the P-38 and the P-80. He was also known for completing projects ahead of schedule, working in a separate division of the company, informally called the Skunk Works. Johnson's design, named CL-282, was based on the Lockheed XF-104 with long, slender wings and a shortened fuselage. The design was powered by the General Electric J-73 engine and took off from a special cart and landed on its belly. It could reach an altitude of 73,000 feet. 22,300 m, and had a 1,600 miles, 1,400 nmi, 2,600 km, radius. The reconnaissance aircraft was essentially a jet-powered glider. In June 1954, the U.S. Air Force rejected the design in favor of the Bell X-16 and the modified B-57. Reasons included the lack of landing gear use of the J-73 engine instead of the more proven Pratt and Whitney J-57, like the competing designs, and not using multiple engines, which, the U.S. Air Force believed, was more reliable. General Curtis LeMay of Strategic Air Command, SAC, walked out during a CL-282 presentation, saying that he was not interested in an airplane without wheels or guns. Approval Civilian officials including Trevor Gardner, an aide to Secretary of the Air Force Harold E. Talbot, were more positive about the CL-282 because of its higher potential altitude and smaller radar cross-section, and recommended the design to the Central Intelligence Agency's Office of Scientific Intelligence. At that time, the CIA depended on the military for overflights, and Director of Central Intelligence Alan Dulles favored human over technical intelligence gathering methods. However, the Intelligence Systems Panel, a civilian group advising the U.S. Air Force and CIA on aerial reconnaissance, had recognized by 1954 that the RB-57D would not meet the 70,000 feet, 21,300 m, requirement that panel member Alan Donovan of Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory believed was necessary for safety. The CIA told the panel about the CL-282, and the aspects of its design that the U.S. Air Force saw as flaws the single engine and light load factor, appealed to Donovan, a sailplane enthusiast who believed that a sailplane was the type of high-altitude aircraft the panel was seeking. Edwin Land, the developer of instant photography, and another member of the panel proposed to Dulles through Dulles aide, Richard M. Bissell, Jr., that his agency should fund and operate this aircraft. Land believed that the military operating the CL-282 during peacetime could provoke a war. Although Dulles remained reluctant to have the CIA conduct its own overflights, Land and James Killian of MIT told President Eisenhower about the aircraft, Eisenhower agreed that the CIA should be the operator. Dulles finally agreed, but some U.S. Air Force officers opposed the project because they feared it would endanger the RB-57D and X-16. The U.S. Air Force Seberg helped persuade his own agency to support the CL-282, albeit with the higher-performance J-57 engine, and final approval for a joint U.S. Air Force-CIA project, the first time the CIA dealt with sophisticated technology, came in November 1954. Lockheed had meanwhile become busy with other projects and had to be persuaded to accept the CL-282 contract after approval. Manufacture Bissell became head of the project, which used covered funding, under the Central Intelligence Agency Act of 1949, the CIA's director is the only federal government employee who can spend unvouchered government money. Lockheed received a $22.5 million contract in March 1955 for the first 20 aircraft, with the first $1.26 million mailed to Johnson's home in February 1955 to keep work going during negotiations. The company agreed to deliver the first aircraft by July of that year and the last by November 1956. It did so, and for $3.5 million under budget. The flight test engineer in charge was Joseph F. Ware, J.R. 
procurement of the aircraft's components occurred secretly. When Johnson ordered altimeters calibrated to 80,000 feet, 24,400 m, from a company whose instruments only went to 45,000 feet, 13,700 m, the CIA set up a cover story involving experimental rocket aircraft. Shell Oil developed a new low-volatility, low-vapor pressure jet fuel that would not evaporate at high altitudes, the fuel became known as JP-7, and manufacturing several hundred thousand gallons for the aircraft in 1955 caused a nationwide shortage of Esso's flit insect repellent. The aircraft was renamed the U-2 in July 1955, the same month the first aircraft, Article 341, was delivered to Groom Lake. The U referred to the deliberately vague designation utility instead of R for reconnaissance, and the U-1 and U-3 aircraft already existed. The CIA assigned the cryptonym Aquatone to the project, with the U.S. Air Force using the name Oilstone for their support to the CIA. James Baker developed the optics for a large format camera to be used in the U-2 while working for Perkin Elmer. The new camera had a resolution of 2.5 feet, 76 centimeters, from an altitude of 60,000 feet, 18,000 m. The aircraft was so crowded that when Baker asked Johnson for six more inches of space for a lens of 240 in, 610 centimeters, focal length, Johnson replied I'd sell my grandmother for six more inches, Baker instead used a 180 in, 460 centimeters, f slash 13.85 lens in a 13 times 13 in, 33 times 33 cm, format for his final design. When the first overflights of the Soviet Union were tracked by radar, the CIA initiated Project Rainbow to reduce the U-2S radar cross-section. This effort ultimately proved unsuccessful, and work began on a follow-on aircraft, which resulted in the Lockheed A-12 Oxcart. TRX RQ-180 In August 2015, the 60th year anniversary of the U-2 program, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works revealed they were internally developing a successor to the U-2, referred to as the UQ-2 or RQX, combining features from both the manned U-2 and unmanned Northrop Grumman RQ-4 Global Hawk and improving upon them. Disclosed details say the design is essentially an improved U-2 airframe with the same engine, service ceiling, sensors, and cockpit, with the main differences being an optional manning capability something Lockheed has proposed for the U-2 to the Air Force several times but has never gained traction, and low observable characteristics. The Air Force has no requirement or time frame for a next-generation high-altitude long-endurance, hail, platform, but Lockheed sees a future need and wants something in development early. Having the option of an onboard pilot is considered a deterrent because it can be used in peacetime situations where unmanned aircraft would more likely be engaged, since there is no possibility of killing a person. The company's last attempt to create a stealth unmanned aircraft was the RQ-3 Dark Star, which never made it past flight testing and was cancelled. Plans for a U-2 replacement would not conflict with development of the State Route 72, another project by the company to create a hypersonic unmanned surveillance plane, as it would be suited for missions that require greater speed for time-sensitive targets. The company released a notional artist's impression of the TRX aircraft at an Air Force Association conference in Washington on September 14, 2015. Its name was changed to mean tactical reconnaissance to reflect its purpose as an affordable peace and wartime ISR aircraft, distinguishing it from strategic, penetrating SR-71 class platforms. TR is a reference to the short-lived rebranding of the U-2 as the TR-1 in the 1980s. Size, and thus cost, is kept down by having less endurance than the Global Hawk at around 20 hours, which is still about the same time as a normal RQ-4 sortie even though it is capable of flying for 34 hours. Although originally planned to be optionally unmanned, some Lockheed officials are leaning towards a purely unmanned aircraft, as it is expected that issues with airspace integration of UAVs will be addressed by the time it will be introduced. The TRX concept is aimed squarely at Air Force needs, and is not currently being marketed to the CIA or other government agencies. It would have increased power and cooling to accommodate new sensors, communication equipment, electronic warfare suites, 
and perhaps even offensive or defensive laser weapons. TRX could be ready for service in the 2025 time frame, with a fleet of 2530 aircraft proposed to replace the nearly 40 aircraft mix of U-2S and RQ-4S. Lockheed revealed more specifications about the TRX at a March 15, 2016 media day, confirming the aircraft would be unmanned and air refuelable. Its maximum takeoff weight would be greater than either the U-2S or RQ-4S at around 54,000 pounds, 24,000 kilograms, with a 5,000 pounds, 2,300 kilograms, payload and 130 feet, 40 m, wingspan. It will use the same F-118-101 turbofan and generator as the U-2, but thrust could increase to 19,000 pounds and power increased to 65-75 kVA, service ceiling would increase to 77,000 feet, 23,000 m, with a second engine. The TRX is meant to be survivable, not unnoticeable, operating outside of enemy air defense bubbles rather than penetrating into them. Fuel the U-2 has used Jet Propellant Thermally Stable, JPTS, since the aircraft's development in the 1950s. JPTS is a high thermal stability, high-altitude fuel, created specifically as fuel for the U-2. JPTS has a lower freeze point, higher viscosity and higher thermal stability than standard Air Force fuels. In 1999, the United States Air Force spent approximately $11.3 million on fuel for the U-2 aircraft and was looking for a lower-cost alternative. JPTS is a specialty fuel and as such has limited worldwide availability and costs over three times the per gallon price of the Air Force's primary jet fuel, JP-8. Research is underway to find a cheaper and easier alternative involving additives to generally used jet fuels. A JP-8-based alternative JP-8 Plus 100 LT, is being considered. JP-8 Plus 100 has increased thermal stability by 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 56 degrees Celsius, over stock JP-8, and is only 0.5 cents per gallon more expensive, low temperature additives can be blended to this stock to achieve desired cold performance. Due to the small landing gear, a perfect balance in the fuel tanks was essential for a safe landing. Similarly to sailplanes, the U-2 had a yaw string on the canopy to detect slip or skid during the approach. A skid during flight with no bank was the hint of an unbalance around the longitudinal axis which could be resolved by moving the fuel to the left or right wing tank. Design The design that gives the U-2 its remarkable performance also makes it a difficult aircraft to fly. Martin Knudsen said that it was the highest workload airplane I believe ever designed and built. You're wrestling with the airplane and operating the camera systems at all times, leaving no time to worry about whether you're over Russia or you're flying over Southern California. The U-2 was designed and manufactured for minimum airframe weight, which results in an aircraft with little margin for error. Most aircraft were single-seat versions, with only five two-seat trainer versions known to exist. Early U-2 variants were powered by Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojet engines. The U-2C and TR-1A variants used the more powerful Pratt & Whitney J-75 turbojet. The U-2S and U-2S variants incorporated the even more powerful General Electric F-118 turbofan engine. High aspect ratio wings give the U-2 some glider-like characteristics, with an engine out glide ratio of about 23,1, comparable to gliders of the time. To maintain their operational ceiling of 70,000 feet, 21,000 m, the early U-2A and U-2C models had to fly very near their never-exceed speed, VNE. The margin between that maximum speed and the stall speed at that altitude was only 10 knots, 12 miles per hour, 19 kilometers per hour. This narrow window is called the coffin corner, because breaching either limit would likely cause airflow separation at the wings or tail. For most of the time on a typical mission the U-2 was flying less than 5 knots above stall speed. A stall would cause a loss of altitude, possibly leading to detection and overstress of the airframe. The U-2S flight controls are designed for high-altitude flight, the controls require light control inputs at operational altitude. However, at lower altitudes, 
the higher air density and lack of a power-assisted control system makes the aircraft very difficult to fly. Control inputs must be extreme to achieve the desired response, and a great deal of physical strength is needed to operate the controls in this manner. The U-2 is very sensitive to crosswinds, which, together with its tendency to float over the runway, makes the aircraft notoriously difficult to land. As it approaches the runway, the cushion of air provided by the high lift wings in ground effect is so pronounced that the U-2 will not land unless the wing is fully stalled. A landing U-2 is accompanied on the ground by a chase car and an assisting U-2 pilot calling off the angles and decreasing aircraft height as the aircraft descends. Instead of the typical tricycle landing gear, the U-2 uses a bicycle configuration with a forward set of main wheels located just behind the cockpit, and a rear set of main wheels located behind the engine. The rear wheels are coupled to the rudder to provide steering during taxiing. To maintain balance while taxiing and take off, two auxiliary wheels called pogos are attached under the wings. These fit into sockets underneath each wing at about mid-span, and fall off at takeoff. To protect the wings during landing, each wingtip has a titanium skid. After the U-2 comes to a halt, the ground crew reinstalls the pogos in one wing at a time, then the aircraft taxis to parking. Because of the high operating altitude and the cockpit's partial pressurization, equivalent to 28,000 feet 8, m, pressure altitude, the pilot wears a partially pressurized space suit which delivers the pilot's oxygen supply and provides emergency protection in case cabin pressure is lost. While pilots can drink water and eat various liquid foods in squeezable containers through a self-sealing hole in the face mask, they typically lose up to 6 pounds kilograms, of weight on an 8-hour mission. Most pilots chose to not take with them the suicide pill offered before missions. If put in the mouth and bitten, the L pill containing liquid potassium cyanide would cause death in 10-15 seconds. After a pilot almost accidentally ingested an L pill instead of candy during a December 1956 flight, the suicide pills were put into boxes to avoid confusion. When in 1960 the CIA realized that a pill breaking inside the cockpit would kill the pilot, it destroyed the L pills and as a replacement its technical services division developed a needle poisoned with a powerful shellfish toxin and hidden in a silver dollar. Only one was made because, as the agency decided, if any pilot needed to use it the program would probably be cancelled. Like the suicide pill, not all pilots carried the coin, and Knudsen did not know of any that intended to commit suicide, he carried it as an escape tool. To decrease the risk of developing decompression sickness, Pilots breathe 100% oxygen for an hour prior to take off to remove nitrogen from the blood. A portable oxygen supply is used during transport to the aircraft. Since 2001, more than a dozen pilots have reportedly suffered the effects of decompression sickness, including permanent brain damage in nine cases. Initial symptoms include disorientation and becoming unable to read. Factors increasing the risk of illness since 2001 include longer mission durations and more cockpit activity. Conventional reconnaissance missions would limit pilot duties to maintaining flight path for camera photography. Operations over Afghanistan included more real-time activities, such as communication with ground troops, increasing their body's oxygen requirements and the risk of nitrogen bubble formation. U-2 pilots now exercise during oxygen pre-breathing. In 2012, modifications were initiated under the Cockpit Altitude Reduction Effort, CARE, increasing the cabin pressure from 3.88 psi to 7.65 psi, a 15,000-foot altitude equivalent. The urine collection device also was rebuilt to eliminate leakage. Sensors Initial missions were flown with the Trimetragon A camera, a modification of existing cameras, consisting of three 24-inch focal-length cameras. This was followed by the B camera with 36-inch focal-length lens and image motion compensation. It was a panoramic camera which took pictures of an extremely large area of the Earth's surface. 6,000-foot reels of film made from ester were used. The aircraft carries a variety of sensors in the nose, Q-bay, behind the cockpit, also known as the camera bay, and wing pods. 
the U-2 is capable of simultaneously collecting signals, imagery intelligence, and air samples. Imagery intelligence sensors include either wet film photography, electro-optic, or radar imagery the latter from the Raytheon SRS-2 system. It can use both line-of-sight and over-horizon data links. Operational History United States Pilot Selection and Training Though the U.S. Air Force and the Navy would eventually fly the U-2, the CIA had majority control over the project, code-named Project Dragon Lady. Despite SAC Chief LeMay's early dismissal of the CL-282, the U.S. Air Force in 1955 sought to take over the project and put it under SAC until Eisenhower repeated his opposition to military personnel flying the aircraft. Nonetheless, the U.S. Air Force substantially participated in the project, Bissell described it as a 49% partner. The U.S. Air Force agreed to select and train pilots and plot missions, while the CIA would handle cameras and project security, process film, and arrange foreign bases. Beyond not using American military personnel to fly the U-2, Eisenhower preferred to use non-US citizens. Seven Greek pilots and a Polish expatriate were added to the U-2 trainees although only two of the Greek pilots were subsequently allowed to fly the aircraft. Their flight proficiency was poor. The language barrier and a lack of appropriate flying experience proved problematic. By late 1955, foreign pilots had been dropped from the program. U.S. Air Force pilots had to resign their military commissions before joining the agency as civilians, a process referred to as sheep dipping, and were always called drivers, not pilots. The program only recruited fighter pilots with reserve U.S. Air Force commissions, as regular commissions complicated the resignation process. The program offered high salaries and the U.S. Air Force promised that pilots could return at the same rank as their peers. The CIA's standards for selection were higher than the U.S. Air Force once the latter began its own U-2 flights, although more candidates were rejected, the CIA's program had a much lower accident rate. Test pilot Tony Levier trained other Lockheed pilots to fly the U-2. By September 1955 he had trained six U.S. Air Force pilots, who in turn trained other sheep-dipped pilots. As no two-seat trainer model was available for the program's first 15 years, training was done before the trainee's first solo flight and via radio. Pilots had to adjust to the U-2's unusual combination of jet engines and enormous, high-lift glider wings, because of the coffin corner they learned of the need to pay complete attention to flying when not using the autopilot. Test Flights As with CIA involvement, besides the normal serial number for each aircraft produced, each U-2 also has an article number assigned, and each U-2 would be referred to with its article number on classified internal documents. The prototype U-2, Article 341, never received a U.S. Air Force serial. The first flight occurred at Groom Lake on August 1, 1955, during what was intended to be only a high-speed taxi test. The sailplane-like wings were so efficient that the aircraft jumped into the air at 70 knots, 81 miles per hour, 130 kilometers per hour, amazing Levier who, as he later said, had no intentions whatsoever of flying. The lake bed had no markings making it difficult for Levier to judge the distance to the ground, and the brakes proved too weak, he bounced the U-2 once before it stopped rolling. Although the aircraft suffered only minor damage, Levier again found landing the U-2 difficult during the actual first test flight three days later. On his sixth try, he found that landing the aircraft by touching down on the rear wheel first was superior to the front. Pilots continued to have difficulty during landing, due to the ground effect holding the aircraft off the runway for long distances. On a test flight on August 8, the U-2 reached 32,000 feet, 9,800 m, proving that Johnson had met his promised specifications and deadline. By August 16, the prototype flew at 52,000 feet, 15,800 m, an altitude never before reached in sustained flight. By September 8, it reached 65,000 feet, 19,800 m. By January 1956, the U-2 so impressed the U.S. Air Force that it decided to obtain its own aircraft. The U.S. Air Force purchased a total of 31 U-2s through the CIA, 
the transaction's code name, Project Dragon Lady, was the origin of the aircraft's nickname. Meanwhile, U-2S conducted eight overflights of the U.S. in April 1956, convincing project overseers that the aircraft was ready for deployment. As often happens with new aircraft designs, there were several operational accidents. One occurred during these test flights, when a U-2 suffered a flameout over Tennessee, the pilot calculated that he could reach New Mexico. Every air base in the continental U.S. had sealed orders on what to do if a U-2 landed. The commander of Kirtland Air Force Base near Albuquerque, New Mexico was told to open his orders, prepare for the arrival of an unusual aircraft making a dead stick landing, and get it inside a hangar as soon as possible. The U-2 successfully landed after gliding for more than 300 miles, 480 kilometers, and its strange, glider-like appearance and the space-suited pilot startled the base commander and other witnesses. Not all U-2 incidents would be so benign, with three fatal accidents occurring in 1956 alone. The first fatal accident was on May 15, 1956 when the pilot stalled the aircraft during a post-takeoff maneuver that was intended to drop off the wingtip outrigger wheels. The second occurred on August 31, when the pilot stalled the aircraft immediately after takeoff. On September 17, a third aircraft disintegrated during ascent in Germany, also killing the pilot. There were other non-fatal incidents, including at least one that resulted in the loss of the aircraft. Cover Story a committee of Army, Navy, Air Force, CIA, NSA, and State Department representatives created lists of priority targets for U-2 and other intelligence-gathering methods. The U-2 project received the list and drew up flight plans, and the committee provided a detailed rationale for each plan for the President to consider as he decided whether to approve it. The CIA's Photo Intelligence Division grew in size to prepare for the expected flood of U-2 photographs. Before the aircraft became operational, however, the Air Force's Project Gene Tricks, which used high-altitude balloons to photograph the Soviet Union, China, and Eastern Europe, led to many diplomatic protests from those countries and for a while CIA officials feared that the U-2 project was at risk. While Gene Tricks was also a technical failure only 34 of the 516 balloons returned usable photographs the balloon flights gave the United States many clues on how the communist countries used radar to track overflights, which benefited the U-2 program. With approval from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, S. Director Hugh Dryden, Bissell's team at the CIA developed a cover story for the U-2 that described the aircraft as used by NACA for high-altitude weather research, the cover story would be used if the aircraft were lost over hostile territory. To support the story, U-2S several times took weather photographs that appeared in the press. The civilian advisors Land and Killian disagreed with the cover story, advising that in case of an aircraft loss, the United States forthrightly acknowledge its use of U-2 overflights to guard against surprise attack. Their advice was not followed, and the weather cover story led to the disaster that followed the May 1960 U-2 loss. First Overflights of Communist Territory The British government in January 1956 approved the U-2S deployment from RAF Lakenheath. NACA announced that the U.S. Air Force Air Weather Service would use a Lockheed-developed aircraft to study the weather and cosmic rays at altitudes up to 55,000 feet. Accordingly, the first CIA detachment of U-2S, Detachment A, was known publicly as the 1st Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, Provisional, WRSP-1. The death in April 1956, however, of British agent Lionel Crabbe while examining Soviet ships in Portsmouth Harbour embarrassed the British government, which asked the United States to postpone the Lakenheath flights. To avoid delays, in June 1956, Detachment A moved to Wiesbaden, Germany, without approval from the German government, while Giebelstadt Army Airfield was prepared as a more permanent base. Eisenhower remained concerned that despite their great intelligence value, overflights of the Soviet Union might cause a war. While the U-2 was under development, at the 1955 Geneva summit he proposed to Nikita Khrushchev that the Soviet Union and the United States would each grant the other country airfields to use to photograph military installations. 
Khrushchev rejected the Open Skies proposal, and the CIA told the President that the Soviets could not track high-altitude U-2 flights. This belief was based on studies using old Savi. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.